Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. Father, we leave your word with you this morning. It's your word, it's not my word. But Father, I have been given the task of preaching from this word. I pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you will anoint me. I pray, Father, you will anoint everyone that's in this room today. Father, not only, Lord God, will I be anointed to speak the word, but your people, Lord God, will be anointed to hear the word, Lord Father, that you will open up their ears, and Lord God, let that word impart their hearts today, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. I'm going to go to the book of Judges, and we're going to break in at chapter 6. I might be camping a little bit, speaking about the man Gideon, but before we even get to Gideon, we get to the start of the chapter, and I'll read a few verses, and then hopefully we're going to unpack them. Praise the Lord. It says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, caves, and strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was, whenever Israel was sown, had sown, Midianites would come up. Also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza. Interestingly, we get Gaza here. And leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock, their tents, coming up as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished before the Midianites, and then the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Amen. Just going to bring a couple of points to this, and the first point I'll bring out, it says, they sinned and they did evil. That's the first thing we read here. And this is a common, a, a common way with Israel. You'd have good times, and then you'd always have bad times. So they were doing good, and then they sinned, and they turned to the gods of this, of this world. They get caught up with the people of the world, and then all of a sudden they took a nosedive, and God turned them over. Hallelujah. So what we're seeing here, God turned them over for seven years. You know, God will always judge sin. Can I say this, guys? You, you'll never get away with sinning. You'll never get away with evil. God must judge sin. God must judge evil. And many times when we get caught up living a particular straight in our life, I want to tell you this, D-Day is coming. There will be a point when God's going to break in your life and he will deal with it. God must judge sin. Sin, hallelujah. It won't let it go. You might think you're getting away with it, but there's going to come a point when God's going to break into your life. We'll just read a couple of verses up here in the book of Romans, because I want to give a New Testament edge. Because everybody says, oh, here we go again. That's Old Testament. Listen, the God of the old is the God of the new. Hallelujah. The God of the old is the God of the new. This is a seamless book, Genesis through to Revelation. Some people like to camp in the new because they like this thought about Jesus, you know, because Jesus is all love and it's all, I mean, we don't want to you know that God of the old who is, seems to be a God of wrath and anger and, and dealing with things. We see here in the book of Romans, and it says here, in fact, at the very beginning of 18, one, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, God's wrath on unrighteousness. But I'll just say a couple of verses. It says, the people rejected God again. And verse 24, this, it says, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts. So God gave them up. Amen. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. So God turned them over. He gave them up. In verse 28, and even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. And then you can read about the things that they got up to. Amen. So God turned them over. God will always have to deal with sin. Amen. The God of love is also the God of wrath. And I think so often we, we forget to know that. How can a God of love be a God of wrath? Well, the Bible says God is a God of wrath. Amen. We've just read that in the book of Romans. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. And we've got this two dynamics. So you're, you're dealing with the God of love. Everybody says, well, we love the God of love, but there is a God of wrath who it deals with the sins of this nation and deals with the sins of his people when we step out of line. I want to tell you about this. When you step out of line, God is going to deal with you. Look at this. I know the dealings of God in my life when I've stepped out of line. Amen. I've been serving God for 37 years, and I know God has dealt with me on a good number of occasions. And I thank God for his dealings with me. Amen. Just as I thank God when my father, when I stepped out of line as a wee boy, I get a smack in the backside, and sometimes my mother used to take a belt to us, you know, in her frustration. And I deserved the belt as well. She was only a wee woman. She'd come in with the belt, and she'd belt me and my big brother, you know. I thank God for the disciplines in those days. Hallelujah, because they were necessary for me to bring me into line. 
And I know the dealings with God as well. So I want to say this, the God of love is also the God of wrath. So many Christians today have reduced the Almighty God to a glorified Santa Claus. And it's all about giving you presents, it's all about giving you presents. You know, big, big Santa, big cuddly Santa, you know, big beard. And that's what I mean, maybe with some people have a God. God's up there, big cuddly, big cuddly daddy. Oh, daddy, daddy, just scooping us in. It's all about just giving you, giving you, giving you. Wealth, health, and prosperity. And we are missing a vital aspect of who this God is. Hallelujah. He's not a Santa Claus, I want to tell you that. And this is the biggest problem in today's church, for we have lost sight of the fear of God. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus says, as I tell you the truth, do not fear the devil. Don't fear the devil and the wickedness of the devil. He says, because all the devil can do is kill you. <laughs> I know, it's, 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 if all he can do is kill you, he says, I tell you the truth, fear him once you're dead, that he's got the power to deal with you for eternity and put you into a bad place. Guys, I had a conversation with Evan Martin because he's off the rails. And before Martin was going down the road to St. I sat there and I sat there as his pastor and I read the riot act to him. And I told him dead on. Because you know, sometimes we can get into that hopelessness and we just think, well, if we kind of lost the will to live. And I want to say this, I want to tell you the truth, Martin. You better get your life together. Because he was very near death, friends. I've got a picture on my phone with Martin. i sitting up with him in the, in the hospital in the, in the, the emergency, high dependency. Right? I sat there looking at him. And I've read it with him, and I says, Martin, you better get your act together. I says, because I tell you this, Martin, you might just fall asleep and you think that's the end of the matter. You're going to wake up and you're going to be in eternity. And that's a very serious business to be in eternity. Get your act together. And I can only trust it does. I got way back to Martin. I got way back to Cork Hill. Be long before you guys, the wee guy walking up Cork Hill about 18, shouting and bawling. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to him, and it took a long time. And then we got him into this church, and he was baptized. My heart was glad. And then to see him getting back down to that road and getting himself back into a terrible place where actually his life was actually pretty close on the wire. And by the grace of God, he's been spared. And I tried to say, Martin, I tried to put the fear of God into him. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just to say, Martin, come on. Come on, son, you're better than this. Do you want to go back to that? He was actually quite close to death. I don't think many of you know it, but he was. You know, I was, you know. And I says, Martin, we need to do, we can do this better. And it's, see when you've got the fear of God in your lives, guys, I want to tell you this, it keeps you on the straight and narrow. Amen. You need to learn the fear of God. Jesus, the Bible tells us, know the fear of God. Know the fear of God. Hallelujah. The fear of God is wholesome. It's good. It's not fear of waiting for my mommy to whack me with a belt. But I want to tell you this, there's a good wholesomeness knowing that there's one who's great and glorious and awesome. And I want to live right because he is an awesome and righteous God. Hallelujah. So we see the first thing God does, what they, they sinned and God turned them over and it was a seven year sentence. It's get put in the prison. And by the way, God doesn't let you off for good behavior, by the way. See, even God judge you and says, right, for seven years, that's seven years, my friend. It's going to last seven years. Just when God says, you're going to get to Abraham, he says, I'm going to take you down. You're going to be in Egypt for 400 years. Then... I will bring them back out again. Guess what? They were in Egypt for 400 years. You read the book of Judges. They sinned. You're, you're in the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. That judgment of God. And God there has turned them over. The next thing we say, because of the oppression of the enemy, they, they were so severe, they were hiding in caves and clefts and strongholds. Because when the enemy came in, they were, their heads were down and you were hiding away in the wee, your wee button bend. I just want to get to the road. I just want to get my head down. And, you know, you were scared and these enemies would come in with one intention, to destroy. They were living in defeat. No stomach for a fight. Survival mode. You know what that survival mode is? You know, you're just getting by. How are you getting? I'm just getting by. I'm just getting by. But you've lost any stomach to do anything. I'm just, I'm just living in a place of defeatism. Guys, I've been there. Been there. With no great ambitions. Just trapped in my, my little world. And just, just getting on with life, but just really struggling to go on with life. No ambitions and just allowing everything to get on top of me. And this was what they were as well. There they were. They were hiding away there. Just had lost the plot. Just, just, just struggling. Today, what are we hiding in? Hiding with homes. Hiding with churches. With no stomach for a fight to actually fight the fight in this spiritual warfare that we're actually dealing with just now. While the enemy runs riot the enemy is running riot in our nation our nation morally is bankrupt 
bankrupt. Not only are we you know, financially bankrupt as a nation, they say Britain now is something like 3.2 trillion pounds in debt. America apparently is over 300 something trillion in debt. Just keep borrowing money, just keep printing money. That's where the nation is. But more importantly, we're bankrupt morally. Morally, we're totally and utterly bankrupt. Things now that go on today would never went on going back 50, 60 years ago. We're now morally, we're corrupt. Sexual perversion is everywhere. I was speaking to a man just recently. I went to get a picture framed and it was like a Sikh. And lovely guy, really lovely guy. But he works in the magistrate offices in um, Glasgow, I think it was, or was it Paisley? And his job is, he says, and this man came in with a bit of paper and he had to sign him off. So he came in as a man and he says, and he, did, he says, it was only a couple of minutes procedure, he says, he insisted on in taking his coat off. He says, and as soon as he took his coat off, he had this wonderful sequence dress. Because now he was getting signed off now, so Tom now was becoming Jane. And he, was, he addressed him as Tom and he put in a complaint against him. He went, hang on a sec here. When you come in here, you were Tom, and I addressed you like that. But when he left, he was Jane. Guys, this is happening all the time. I mean, it's amazing. And even he, and it's the law that's doing this. This nation, my friends, is upside down, completely and utterly upside down. And we, as a church, are to blame because we allowed, we lost our anointing, and we lost our authority, and we lost our fight. When we should be standing up and saying, Enough is enough. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And the church needs to find itself again. So we can see here, the enemy is running riot. I've got down here and I'm speaking, I bring myself into this, I'm not pointing fingers. But much of the church is full of spineless people. Weak, purposeless, afraid to take action or oppose people that they should be, that they should. Gutless and no backbone. And maybe I'll include myself in that as well, amen. So I just, I, I, like, I look back at myself in the mirror, Amen. We've, we've sat back, and there's a great battle out there, but we're sitting back, and we need someone to rise up and to challenge the status quo. We're hiding when we should be out there in the front lines. And I might add, guys, I am out there in the front lines. So, well, you're the pastor. Well, praise God. I was out there in the front lines before I was a pastor. I cut my teeth in that, out there, just reaching out with the gospel. And there's so much more to that that we can do there. And this was the state of affairs. The enemy had now came against them, they had lost their will to fight. They were trapped and they were kind of just subdued and they weren't rising up to tackle the enemy. Glory to God because of the heaviness that was upon them. Three, it says, whenever they planted their crops, the enemy would appear. Amen. It's always the same, isn't it? Whenever they decided, right, we need to go and grow our crops, then the harvest time, the enemy knew when the harvest time was and the enemy would come in and say, right, let's go. We're going to destroy their works. You know, John 10, 10 says, the devil is, a, 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 is, a, is like a thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's the work of Satan. A thief who comes to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. Amen. That's his job. And whenever he sees things happening, he's going to come and he wants to bring devastation. Amen. They enter the land to destroy it or ravish it. Um, the New Testament, uh, the New International says ravage. The ravage in, in dictionary says to cause severe and extensive damage. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what the enemy comes to do. He, he doesn't want to see you getting ahead. He doesn't want to see you rising up. He doesn't want to see any spiritual growth in you. He wants to keep us in a place of weakness and weakness and just keeping us vulnerable so that we can, nobody will be willing to fight. Hallelujah. Well, you know, whenever you want to start to rebuild your spiritual life, something happens. Is it only me that's ever recognized that? You ever been in a place when you've really been struggling? You say, right, okay, Lord, you get in your knees. You say, right, Lord, I'm going to change. I want to, I'm going to do something. And then before the week's out, oh, hell breaks loose or something happens. And before you know it, you lose the plot. And then, and then you've lost that wee moment to say, right, I'm going to get back to God. And then but it's gone. And then guess what? You're back in that. Because the enemy will always attack. Whenever you start to come alive in the things of the Spirit, the enemy is going to come against you and says, no, 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 no. I'm going to put a bucket of water on you right immediately. I'm going to bring you back down to this place of defeatism. Because anyway, that's what the enemy wants us. Defeatism because we're what? We're no threat to him. So whenever they see something building, something will happen. He's come. But you know something? The enemy can only steal from you if you've got something worth stealing. 
I know some people say, well, I don't, I don't get bothered with the devil. That's probably because you're not bothering him. <laughs> that's, 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 the, that's, the nuts, that's the nuts and bolts. I remember a uh, long, 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 long time ago, we stayed in Renfrew, we stayed in a wee apartment, and I was struggling. I had a wee business going. Uh, I was in fellowship, but I was, you know, I was just you know, sitting out there with you guys. I had a little business, and I ran into trouble. I ran up a bit of debt. Pool tax, remember the pool tax? I was struggling with that. My income tax, I was struggling with that. Took out a paper article thinking I was getting a lot of money. Angela thought I was getting a lot of money would come back for me. It backfired. I had the bill to pay for that. I get taken to court. And, you know, we have a small claims court. And then before you know it, a £400 bill became an £800 bill. Well, how does that work? I think it's just, yes, sir. I says, you know. And it got so bad at times, and we're really kind of struggling. You're trying your best to pay off. And I remember this day, out the blue, we had Paul and Toki Haywood. This couple came up from England, and they were staying with us in this wee apartment. And there was a knock on the door, and there was a sheriff officer came to the door. Out the blue, a bit of paper. He had, he had, the, he had the right to come into my house and value all my goods. <laughs> Me and Linda were mortified. Paul and Toki, they, could, they knew something was happening. I think they stayed in the bedroom and put on a bit of music. Me and Linda were standing in the bedroom like that. I saw the me and Linda went in the living room. We were standing like that. The guy came in with a bit of paper. Right. He's looking at, the, he's looking at our ornaments. He's like, you know, looking, looking at our TV. Looking at this. Looking at everything. He's looking at us. Do you know what the sad thing was? <laughs> there was nothing of value. <laughs> I was humiliated. We were humiliated with a couple next door and here's this guy wanting to get around the house and he just looked at the stuff like that and it was nothing for him, you know. Nothing of value that they could come in, you know, like you've got a crown jewels or you had a big gold thing and sitting on top of the mantelpiece that would be worth a couple of grand. Well, we never had anything like that. I remember being absolutely humiliated. True story. Humiliated and then they walked out in me and Linda. I feel like crying. Eventually I had to laugh a wee bit because this couple was next door and I, I, knew, they, I knew they knew but they acted as if they didn't, you know. They had a wee bit of music on they came out. Oh, was that just some friends that came by? I remember another time my dad was into gardens and um, I remember taking my dad, we got a lot of flowers for his garden. I said, I'm going to get this new house. God bless this. And we've moved on a wee bit since those days, right? Amen. I paid off every single penny that I owed. Every single penny I was forced to pay back because we couldn't get a mortgage without it. Glory to God, God undertook for us and we eventually got a mortgage and this is the wee house we've got just now. We call it Engedi because it means so much to us because we know what it's like to be in a bad place. Hallelujah. And so I was getting these plants. I said, I'll get some plants as well. Dad, I've got my nice wee garden. I'm going to put them in as well. He says, you better get yourself some slug tablets. I went, what for? He went, snails. I went, Dad, I've not got any snails in my garden. There's no snails in my garden, Dad. Don't worry about that. Everything's fine. And I dug it all over nicely and I put my wee plants in. And then within a couple of days, I realized all these snails appeared. Because the snails now, because I put my plants in, the snails were coming for the plants. No, the snails, no snails in my garden until I planted something. And then the snails come. No, snails are tricky wee things. They hide, don't they, in the darkness, you know, but then they come out and then they're going to attack your planting. I use that as an illustration. Satan will only come and steal if there's something for him to steal. See, when you start to say, God, start to plant stuff in my life, start to do something in my life, I want to tell you this, all hell's going to break loose. Test me, test me. Get before God, and I mean seriously, and say, God, I'm just going to get, I'm starting to, Lord, I'm fed up living like this, that's it, I'm going to get my knees, I'm going to start praying, I'm going to start doing something for the kingdom of God. I want to tell you this, expect trouble, it's coming to your door, because all the minute the devil says, oh, did you hear that, guys? Oh, there's somebody want to do something for God, right, lads, let's deal with that. That's it, guys. The Bible says we war in the heavenlies. There is a spiritual realm. There is demonic powers and demons all over the place. And they are out to destroy anything that would ever actually seek to be a challenge to their kingdom. And we can see these things. So he likes to keep us weak and he wants to keep us vulnerable. Amen. Do you know what I feel a bit weak? I've, just, I've, just, I've, I've, um, I've picked up a couple of injuries. And, um, and so I wanted to start running. I've given myself a happy thought. A happy thought. My happy thought is, I wonder if I could do a marathon before I'm 65. And I'm 65 next year, right? And it's a happy thought. I've never run more than, I've never run more than 8K, to be truthful, right? And I went, so, but I picked up these injuries and I was running, I was struggling, right? So I'm running and I was like, and so I've, somebody blessed me and asked me to go and see this physio. I thought it was bones, you know, I'm thinking, I ain't running towards a new hip or a new knee, okay? So I went up to this physio up in Glasgow, and the guy's meant to be good, and he's testing me and all the rest of it. He says, no, no, no. He says, that's not bones. He says, it's muscles. He says, your muscles are out of shape. There's knots in your muscles, and da, da, da. And he says, so, 
he says, so he, he goes, I'm going to give you a, a sports massage. I went, a massage? He goes, you ever had a massage? I went, no, no, no. He says, we're going to give you a sports massage. So bang, you're doing your shorts, boof, you're up on this table. I mean, I'm ready for screaming. I'm ready for screaming through the roof. I mean, what the heck's he doing in my muscles? I mean, the pain and the agony. And he's worked on this muscle, and he worked on that muscle, and he worked on this muscle and that muscle. And all of a sudden, now he starts doing his work, you know. He says, your muscles are out of shape. We need to get them in shape. Hallelujah. So then last night, some, this guy blessed me also, and he got me a gym membership up at the Bowfield. And, um, and I went up there last night, and um, I'm sitting here earlier doing my study, and I went, right, I'm going to go up for the last wee hour and a half, and it was empty, it was brilliant. And I went up there, and I started going on the machines. Uh, Craig, Brian, and see, oh, you, see you guys up the Haven? I know you still you you got that wee gym thing up there. I was humiliated. Thank God there was nobody else in the room. I'm going, that's all right. Okay, I put it in that way. Well, now you can put extra weights on. <laughs> I was like, I need for peace. <laughs> and I says, right, time's up here. I need to work these muscles because my muscles are out of shape. And God's speaking to me all the time because my, my mind's always tuned in and all the rest of it. That's like your faith. That's like, that's like your spirituality. You know, you might think, well, hey, I'm strong physically, but when you look at in the, in the, in the, in the spiritual level, how strong are you spiritually? And I thought, I need to get my act together. So that's me. I have started this with regime. Then I was in the pool swimming, blah, 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 and all the rest of it. I'm just throwing that out there for you because your muscles are very important for your, for your strength. Faith is more important, amen, for our spiritual strength. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So Satan wants to keep us weak and vulnerable. He doesn't want us to... He doesn't want you to see us coming alive in God. But God wants you to come alive. Maybe this is a message for somebody today. God wants you to come alive. Funny enough. No, I'll miss that one out. <laughs> Another wee thought just came out. Um, no, I will tell you. So I, I did a run first thing in the morning as well. See, remember I told you, I, I was trying to run and this muscle kept coming out. See, after I got that physio one thing and I strengthened my muscles, I went for my run up the braze, right? And I did it, no problem. I'm not telling you how far I run, but I was on, this was holding me back and I was running. So I'm running along, along and I'm running along another way road and here's a sign at the end. Here's a sign in the middle of the road. You're good enough. Well, what the heck's that mean? <laughs> a side of the road, there's this sign in Catlaw Road. There's this sign just there and it says, you're good enough. And what does that mean? It meant nothing to me, but guess what? It means something to somebody. And somebody put a sign there at the end of the road and they went, you're good enough. And I get, I, 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 when I was running on, I thought to myself, that means something to somebody. But it was, but not to me. Somebody obviously is going to drive by that road and they're going to look there and they're going to see that sign and it's going to really mean something to them. And this is what I was thinking about the prophetic word because I'm thinking, because my mind is, see when I run, my mind's tuning in. I've just, I've just did a lot of reading and my mind is tuning in to the word I'm going to bring just now. And I thought, do you know, I could be speaking here this morning and maybe 80% of you is what's going to be like, it's going over the top of your head. But maybe 20% of you are sitting out there and it's all like that. That's really talking to me. That means something to me. Do you know something? Do you know what I'm really saying for all of you, and I include myself in it, God wants us to be better than what we are. Amen. Trouble is, you're the problem. Not God. You're the problem. You need to look up and get your eyes off yourself and get your eyes off your circumstances and say, hang on a sec here. And maybe that word's for you. I'm just telling you, you're good enough. Because we you know if you ever get a mentality, you think, I'm not good enough. Anybody ever said that? Oh, I'm just not good enough. I used to say it all the time. If I could fast forward, take you back, you know, I'd say, well, I'm just not good enough. Never did well at school, never did good at that, never did good at this. Just got myself in there, right? And I always thought, I just wasn't good enough. And I wasn't cutting it. But deep down within me, I was crying out. And thank God for the day that God came and took hold of me. Glory to God. And he says, you're good enough. Maybe that's a word for somebody. And I wasn't even going to bring it, but now it's coming out there. Maybe somebody has to hear that. You're good enough. The enemy's a liar. And he will say, you're no good enough. You're no good. But God will come and say, no, you're good enough. I'm excited about that. I don't know about you. <laughs> I wonder what that sign was about. Yes, I mean, you're good enough. What the heck's that? Who put that out there in the middle of nowhere? You know, maybe it's a happy 40th or happy 50th. And it's, you're good enough. Maybe it's for you. Somebody in here, you need to hear that. You're good enough. Because the enemy's a liar. Let's go on to the final point here. And I could camp a little bit more than that. The devil wants to keep us down, but God wants to lift us up. 
And the last point, when they come to the end of it, we got this verse 6 here that says, Then they came to their senses, then they, become, they became, they cried out to the living God. Hallelujah. They cried out to the living God. Glory to God. They cried out. They cried out. Do you know something? Hate, Satan hates it when we cry out. And I mean, really cry out. When you're out of sorts with the Lord, it's usually the last thing you want to do, isn't it? See, when you're not walking properly, see, the last thing you want to do is cry out to God. Because you know you're not, you just know you're not living properly and you struggle to get the words out of your mouth. God help me. We tend to we tend to leave that to the very end, don't we, guys? We want God to help us, but we're unwilling to deal with the sin that's in our lives and the hassle that I'm actually got about there. So it hinders us, and Satan knows that will hinder us. Remember this, guys, God will never compromise his holiness and his righteousness. He will never compromise. God will not make deals with the devil, and he will certainly not make deals with us as well. When you think, well, God, I can have this, but can I hang on to that? God will not make deals with sin, my friends. Let me just read this, because I've got it out here, just to kind of flash that up there. Luke 13. God must deal with sin, and it's good for you to know that, guys, because when you know that God will deal with it, then it will help you to get rid of it. They were present at the season, some who told him, verse 1 in Luke 13, and they says, and they told him about the blood Pilate had mingled with the sacrifice. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans are worse sinners than all the others? Because they suffer such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will always, you all likewise will perish. Are those 18 who died in the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. Repent. That's one of those words, isn't it? <laughs> sorry seems to be the hardest word. Amen. Oh, isn't it? I'm Sorry. I'm guilty of that as well. You know, when the wife upsets you, know, are you upset the wife and all that? And it's like, say you're sorry. Well, I'm sorry, that's like I read. That, 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 does, that does nothing for me. Say you're sorry. No. No, I won't say I'm sorry. Just say you're sorry. No. Hey, I'm the pastor of the church. You know, there's sometimes I just say, no. I'm not going to admit to that. It's not my fault. Such and such. How, how can we, we all, we're all kind of wired that way, aren't we? Sometimes we kind of justify the situation. When, when we will try everything in the book to fix the problem. <sighs> Trouble is, with many, they already have justified the position or they blame someone else. It was their fault, it was his fault, it was something else that went wrong. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. No, it's always everything else, but it's not me. And therefore, we have to sometimes have a good look at ourselves and say, hang on a sec here, I'm the problem. And now when they we got to the end of themselves, and probably towards the end of the seven years, it says they got such a point that they broke and says, what on earth am I doing here? <laughs> what on earth am I doing here? Look at the state of me. And then the penny drops, I'm a mess. It took them probably seven years to actually get to this place where they've been impoverished and impoverished and get to the point that they get to the point and said, and now they're forced to cry out to God. Thank God when we cry out to the living God, when he can hear the cries of those who cry out to him. I'll get down here, there's a cry and there's a cry. Does that make sense? When I wrote that, I says there's a cry and then I've got, and then there's a cry by a capital C. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> it's a kind of crocodile tears and then there's a genuine tears, you know, when you're broken. I know those genuine tears, friends. I know... I can go back a long time ago when I would be driving along this, the, the, the road and I'm not going to take you into my past, but my past is there. And I'm telling you, I was a broken man. I was a broken man. I was just on the side of the road and I was crying my eyes out. I remember walking across the field and I, I, I climbed over a gate and I fell on my face and God was doing work in me and I was, just, I, was just, I was just broken, broken before the living God. And thank God God heard that cry. And there's people in here there's people in here that will identify with that. But let me just go as I come to finish and, um, and we can listen to some, some glorious prayers or, or those cries that just pierce, pierce the darkness. And go to 1 Samuel and I just want to read the woman Hannah. Hannah was broken. She was barren. Um, her husband had another wife and she was producing kids left, right and center. But this woman, she, she could not. In those days, if you could not have a child, Anton, it's great to see you, man. Praise the Lord. And she cried, and she cried, and she cried, and she cried, and nothing was happening, nothing was happening. We read this situation. She's up, up to one of the feasts. 
And it says, and, and, and Elka Hannah, her husband, said to her in verse 8 in chapter 1, he says, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better than you and ten sons? But then Hannah rose, she'd finished, once she'd all finished eating, and she goes to the house of the Lord, and Eli is sitting there at the door. And she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed to the Lord, and she wept in anguish. Then she made a vow, and she says, O Lord of hosts, if you indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, and remember me, and forget your, and do not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And of course, Eli, the great man of God, he thought she was drunk. <laughs> Because I'm not drunk. She says she was praying, but her lips were not moving. It was a prayer from the heart of brokenness. She cried out. She was crying out to the living God. I am crying out to the living God in despair. And guess what? It says at the end of that, it says she left the house of God and she was no longer devastated. She just walked and she was different. She was, there was a kind of happiness about her because, you know, that time she knew God heard her cry. Do you know something, guys? I want you to tell you there's something powerful about a cry. There's many times we can cry, but I want to tell you, see when God does deep business in your heart and you cry out, literally cry out to him, you know that cry. You know that cry, and you know that cry. Hallelujah. When there was a time in our lives when we cry and we just get to the point, and we've cried out in God immediately, God answers the cry. Guy, there's a godly cry that God is waiting for. Hallelujah. I've got so much more to say about that for the nation, but that will probably save that for another time. God is waiting to hear the cry, the cry that will come from us when we get to the end of ourselves and say, oh God, I've had enough. I am praying that that will be the case for Thomas. When something happens, for Martin, you would just think you would just get to the point, you get to the point, you say, God, I can no longer live like this. God, you need to help me. When you can say that for your, for, your, for your heart and you cry out, I've been there, guys. I've, I've, I've been there and I cried. I've cried out to him. Up there in the hills when I've done business with God, even as a minister. Because sometimes seeing this field of being a minister, everybody thinks it's glamorous. Glamorous, you must be joking, my friends. Joking. When you get through all the things, people come, people go. One minute they're standing up here saying, oh, you're wonderful, you're wonderful. The next minute they're out there and they're stabbing you in the back and cutting you to threads, mouthing off again, she's screaming at you. And I'm having to just stand here and just say, well, we're, we're, we're. that's it. That's what, that, you know, ministry, you think ministry is a fun game. There's some ministers take it serious. I happen to be one of them. I've been up in my wee place before God. Now, I want to tell you this. Here's one of my crying. I'm going to finish with this, right? Sometimes I get to them and I say, God, I don't cut it. I'm not cutting it. I'm not cutting it because you think this place needs to be filled or this is that. And sometimes I get to the end of myself, God, I'm not cutting it. And then one time, there's a big cairn up on the top of my house and I threw myself on top of these stones like that. And the early hours, I'm saying, God, either you use me or you take my life, but don't leave me to be some sap sitting here in this pulpit talking week after week after week and everybody's all sitting there going like that. I wonder when he's going to finish, we can get back out and get and get and da, da, da. And you think, is this it? Is this it? I says, there's something, got to be something more from me, Lord, because either I'm in or I'm out, or you take me out. Take my life, but don't leave me being some pathetic, another pathetic clown of a pastor. And there are many, and I've been there from time to time, but I want to get serious with God. I want to say, listen, I, need, I want to buy in this. I want to get serious. Hallelujah. And I was going back a number of years ago. Maybe I need to go back and I need to visit that. And I went, surely, Lord, there's something more that you've got in store for me. Hallelujah. I want to tell you this. God loves those cries. When you come to the point of brokenness, he says, I can't, I can't do this in my own strength. God says, amen. I never asked you to do it in my strength. I'm asking you to do it in my strength. And God's busy breaking us. Breaking us, breaking us, breaking us, breaking us, breaking us, breaking us, breaking us. Till they get to the point you're just so broken. God says, no. No, I can do something. Now I can do something. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And we're going to be reading about that as we move into next week. And we'll read about the man Gideon. Because you know something? It looks as if the devil's got the high ground and he's running a mock in our nation. And it's left the whole nation. It's like it's done and it's dusted. You know, it's like, he's like they're dead. But he doesn't know the mighty God. Because behind the scenes, God's working in people's lives. Hallelujah. And there is going to be a mighty move. And there's going to be mighty men God's going to be raised up. Listen. 
If you want God to raise you up, you just need to cry out to him and just say, right, okay, Lord, I'm making room for you and I'm going to open up my heart to you. And don't keep saying, well, I'm a nobody. Well, you can keep saying that to your blue in the face. That was a bunch of people there. They were all hiding in their wee caves. Oh, their wee caves. Just hiding away there. That's fine. That's fine. It's time to come out your cave. It's time to just say, hey, here am I. Here I am. Here's, here I am. I give myself into your hands. Now let your kingdom come and now let your will be done. Amen. And I want you to tell you this. It's amazing what God can do with a man or a woman. And so D.L. Moody says this. The world's yet to see what God can do with one man who's totally committed to the plans and the purposes of God. Now Norman could go up here and tell us about D.L. Moody. He was just a simple man over there in America. In shoe, worked in a shoe factory. Nothing great about this man. And someday when he heard those words of a friend, somebody says, God's yet to see the man. He said quietly in his heart, he went, I'm going to be that man. That was all he said. The rest is history. We don't know what God was doing them, but there was a man now. All of a sudden, he changed his way, and now all of a sudden, now he did business with God, and the rest is history, and you can read about it. Can I encourage you, all of us today, and I encourage myself, you're good enough. You're good enough. We're all good enough. We're created in the image of God. I can say, well, you don't know my background. Forget your background. That means nothing to God. God's only looking for somebody who's going to say, look, I'm going to open up my heart to him now. I'm going to make room for him. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help, support, and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.